Please turn now in your Bibles or on your phone uh, to Luke chapter 9. We're going to begin with verse 10. It's, if it's in your, on the Pew Bible, the black Bible's in front of you. It's page 866. It is good if you want to just have your Bible open and go through and see if what I'm saying is actually from the Bible and not just me making stuff up. Always an important test as God feeds us by His own Word. Um, just a, a note as we turn to this very well-known passage, I will be on study leave just for a few days, just for this week. Uh, just means I've got some, about three writing projects I'm trying to get done, probably too many. Uh, but basically, if you have a church thing or a pastoral thing, uh, please contact Pastor Rolo. Obviously, if it's an emergency, I'm here. Uh, and then he will be bringing us God's word next week from Daniel. So look forward to that and pray for him. But now we're going to be in Luke 9, Luke 9 and verse 10. Luke 9 and verse 10. Let's hear God's word together. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he, and he welcomed them, and he spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and had them all sit down, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Father, we just pray that you would feed us now uh, with this heavenly manna, your provision for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever come to a place in your life where you just felt completely abandoned, just completely on your own, no one understood, no one was there for you, and so it was just up to you. Or maybe even more importantly, have you ever met someone like that, a brother or sister or a neighbor, and they just felt all alone? How, how did you treat them? There was a young woman that used to come here with her husband years ago, and I'll just call her Barbara, but I was getting together with her and asking her about her life and her career and her education. And she told me the story of how around 18, 19, 20 years old, she was kind of floundering in life and living at home and wasn't quite sure what to do. So her mom uh, talked her into applying to different, well, 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 really just looking at different colleges and maybe she could go to one. So they lived up um, a few towns north of here and she said, let's go look at University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And Barbara said, all right. And so they got in the car, and they drove down 81. They pulled up to the admissions center. And as they pulled up to the admissions, her mom went to the back of the car and got out a couple of suitcases full of her stuff and said, Barbara, here you go. I've already talked to them. You're admitted. Good luck. And she got in the car and she drove off and left her daughter, literally, this is a true story, left her there on the steps of the admissions office and said, you're on your own, hope it goes well. Well, believe it or not, 
Barbara took that as a gift, and there she went. She went into the admissions office with her suitcases, got it in a dorm, and started classes, and then ended up graduating from there. Now, parents, I do not recommend that as a tactic. But have you ever just felt that you've been cast off with no one there to help you? And so we come now to this very famous and beloved story of the feeding of the 5,000. And many of you are familiar with it. You grew up, if you grew up in the church, you know this story. If you didn't, maybe you've heard it before because it's in all four Gospels. But what's often missed is the context of the story in which it takes place. If you look at verse 10, we read that on their return, the 12 apostles told Jesus everything that had occurred. And then after that, the crowds find them. So what, what's going on here, and what is Luke trying to highlight in his telling of the story? And this is an example, if you're leading a Bible study, for instance, where it is helpful to go to the other four Gospels and look at what they all emphasize. So, for instance, if we go to Mark, his emphasis appears to be on Jesus' love for the crowd. He says that Jesus looked at the crowd, he had compassion on them, and he saw they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he cared for them. But Luke, for whatever reason, leaves out that phrase. He, I'm convinced Luke is writing his gospel with Mark, the gospel of Mark, already written in front of him, or at least fragments of it. And so Luke leaves this out. But he does something different. Instead of emphasizing Jesus being a shepherd that cares for the crowds, like, uh, like we'll sing later in Psalm 23, Luke talks about the 12 more. If you look at verse 12, actually, uh, ironically, it says that, that then the 12 came to Jesus. When they saw the crowd coming, the 12. Now, who are the 12? These are the 12 apostles, the special ones that had been sent out, by uh, commissioned by Jesus to start the church and who had sent out. And so we're going to begin here with the context to understand what, what, what is Jesus teaching them? What is he teaching us? And so by talking about the 12, Luke recalls verse 1, where Jesus gives them power and authority to cast out demons and to heal. And so now they, they go out, and now they're coming back, and they're pumped up. They're encouraged, because many of the villages they had gone to received the word, and the apostles saw the kingdom of God going through them. They were able to heal with their own hands, at least at this moment. The demons fled before them, and so they're coming to report to Jesus. And at the same time, what's interesting is they also report that some of the villages rejected them. So some received the word with gladness, and that was exciting, but others rejected them. That's verse 5. And that, but yet there, they also get an encouraging instruction from Jesus. You might remember this, that if, the, if some villages rejected them, the apostles didn't have to like stay there forever and, and set up camp and try to beat them over the brow again and again. Jesus said, leave those unbelieving villages. Just take the dust off your feet and wipe it off. Now in saying that, Jesus was not saying those villages were necessarily going to hell. He was saying that they weren't the apostles' responsibility. And so there's this very encouraging thing going on here. Some are receiving the word, and they're excited about that. Others are rejecting the word, but they, can just, they have the freedom to not worry about those crowds. But now the question is, what happens when the crowds find you anyway? See, that's the context of all this. The apostles were pumped up, no doubt, but they are also likely exhausted. That's why we read in verse 10 what we do, I think, that Jesus took them away to a desolate area to just get away with him. And they go to a little town called Bethsaida where, the, where they won't be bothered. Just time alone with Jesus to, to, to refuel, to recharge their batteries. And look, we all need this. We all need time alone with Jesus. And it's easy to apply this to pastors and missionaries. And this is why we have a sabbatical policy. If 
for pastors and even our elders and deacons that volunteer their time. And if they get too tired or if something happens, they can always take a break. But every six years, we say to them, you have to take a break. You need to just recharge and spend time alone with Jesus and, and get off of these boards just for a year. So it's easy to apply it to those you see up front. But let me tell you something. What, what about your lives this past Monday through Friday? Or as I've heard from some of you late into the night last night because you worked the game and yet you're still here. And so, you know, why are you here? Well, you've, you all have poured out yourselves super, uh, th th with God's strength to help others. You may not have preached, you may not have supernaturally healed, but you have still spent the week serving. You showed up at home every day and done the dishes. You, you've gone to your job every day, even though you, you sometimes don't like it. You showed up in class. You've learned new things. You've continued to serve in your ministries or at church. And I've just been amazed watching how well you all serve. Serving your customers, learning new material, changing diapers, taking care of that difficult spouse sometimes. Week in and week out. And, and you've done all this quietly for God's glory. And, and as, as you've done that, what I want you to hear is that Christ's kingdom is advancing through you all. As, as people see Jesus' love in you, that, and, and you're giving them opportunities to be open to God's word in this very cynical culture. When they look at the media and they look at the news reports and they see the way some Christians or reported Christians behave, the real kingdom is advancing through you all, showing up at work, aspiring to live quiet lives and to work with your hands, as Paul says. But the thing is, it is tiring. And serving in the church and just giving up your time or serving in your campus ministries behind the scenes is faithful, but it can be exhausting and we all need time alone with Jesus. And that, that's really what Sunday's for. That's, what, that's why you come this morning. And I know many of you are serving. Uh, we've seen them serve up front, and they're in the sound booth, and they're in the nursery. But we need to begin each day resting in what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. That's how we begin. That's, we all need it. As the Heidelberg Catechism puts it, that we let the eternal Sabbath begin in us. That we remember God's love for us in Jesus. That he has paid the price for all our sins by his death on the cross. That he rose again from the dead for us. And that's the first day of the week. And so we, we begin by saying we need rest. We need you, Jesus. We need time alone with you. That's what the Lord's Day is for each week. So I hope you don't just come and, and get the worship done. I mean, I'm so, oh, this is so important. I'm so glad you're here. But I hope then you also can spend the rest of the day resting in Christ and then getting back to serving him. That, that's what these disciples were getting. That's what they were having here. And so we can understand then why they might be a little bit annoyed. We understand then that, that Christ has given us this life to enjoy, that, the, that, that we should, you all, we all need time away uh, on retreats and vacations and enjoying our hobbies. And you never should let a, a pastor make you feel guilty for enjoying the life that God has given you. And so the apostles are getting this, but then the crowds find them anyway. And so what do you do when you're out of strength, you're exhausted, but then somebody else comes into your life that needs your help? And so Jesus uses this interruption of their Sabbath to teach them what it looks like to be like Christ in this moment. And so we're going to, to move on, and then we see three ways, just three simple ways that Jesus trains his disciples when their rest is interrupted. First, 
Jesus shows them his own heart. Do you see this in verse 11? It's, just a, it's almost a phrase that just passes right on by. The, the crowds show up. They follow Jesus into this retreat space. And what does Jesus do? He welcomes them. And then he teaches them. And then he heals them because many of them are sick. He's doing the thing he had commissioned his apostles to do. And when his apostles are out of strength, Jesus does it for them. And so he sets an example for them of what his heart is. And it's an example for us as well. When even when we're getting that rest we need, when in God's providence somebody interrupts it, we must remember the heart of Christ. And that he provides for us. And so to not resent it when we have a chance to welcome others. Now, maybe it means that we refer them to someone else. That's what I'll be doing on study leave. If you email me this week, that that I, I make sure that somebody else is taking care of you. But we can't just ignore it. We, we can't just say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you have a great, that you're starving or that you're in the hospital or that your marriage is falling apart. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm off here watching a repeat of the football game. Why well, you'd watch that game again, I don't know. But we then say, let me find someone who can help you. I'll get to you tomorrow. We can't ignore people in their need. And we must remember that we're all on this long pilgrimage of life together. And in the end, in the end, whenever that is for us, there will be rest and reward enough. That's where we fix our eyes. That's where we're ultimately going. That ultimately we'll get that eternal Sabbath, that eternal feast, that you're going to live forever. And when you die, you won't die, but you'll be raised again with Christ. And so we find that little extra bit of strength to help them. But you see, besides Jesus training his disciples and setting an example There there is actually one other thing I want us to see about this. Because you may not feel like one of the disciples. You may actually be like the crowd, where you're needing to come to Christ. And so here's what I want you to see. Jesus will never turn you away. Jesus always has time for you. Jesus always welcomes you. Maybe you're not in the inner circle of a church or a ministry and, and, and you're trying to come to Christ through them and, and maybe they're ignoring you. Maybe they failed you. I, I talk, maybe the church has let you down. Maybe you felt abused by the leadership. I talk to people that this happens all the time, actually. It's a real problem, I think, in so many ways. And maybe I have let you down over the years and in certain ways. I've certainly felt that I have with different people over uh, from time to time. And so here's what I need you to hear. Jesus is always there for you. There have been times in my life where I have felt like I am on my own in a particular trial or struggle that no one understands me. But I could always go to Jesus. He always had time for me. He has never abandoned me. He has answered all of my prayers to meet my needs as he has ordained. And so even if you feel misunderstood, even if you feel abandoned, if the church has brought you to a new college and dropped you off and said, good luck with that, here's a couple of suitcases, Jesus is there for you. You're never on your own. That's what this story is about. And Jesus wants his disciples to see that. But but there's a second way Jesus trains his disciples besides showing them his heart. And and we see this in verses 12 and 13. And, And it's a little complicated, but let's see if we can see this. And that is that as the crowds come, here we begin to get a little clue that the, the 12 are annoyed. He, they tell Jesus. They're, they're telling Jesus what to do. So that, that gives you one clue that they're not in the right place spiritually. They say, send the crowds away to other villages to, to get provided. 
that Bethsaida apparently is not enough to provide for these 5,000 men and their families. So who knows how many people are really there? 15,000, 20,000, we don't know. There's not enough provision for them here. It would be kind of like trying to host a Virginia Tech game out in Narrows or, or down in Floyd County. Beautiful places, but not, just not enough hotel space for them or restaurants. But what's interesting, of course, is that Jesus is going to take care of these crowds, but first he wants to teach his disciples something. And so he tells them a surprising thing, I think. Verse 13, he says to the apostles, you give them something to eat. And, and they respond, from what? We've, we've looked around in our close party, and all we can find are these, these five loaves and two little fish, or maybe big fish, who knows? And the Gospel of John tells us, by the way, if you grew up in Sunday school, this that it was a little boy who brought it. Uh, we don't know whether his grandma packed him a nice lunch like the stories go, but somehow in their close company, they, they looked around. I mean, it's not that they did a search of all 5,000 families, and that's all they found, but right there around them, this is all we've got. And this is what's so interesting to me. Do you remember how back up in verse... Two, if you were here, when they went out on their healing mission and their preaching mission, uh, Jesus said, don't bring anything with you. Don't bring a staff. Don't bring a money. Don't bring an extra cloak. Don't bring food. Because why? Well, it's what we've been singing. They were to depend on God daily for provision. That the, they, like the Israelites, depending on God for that manna. So the apostles Somehow, God was going to provide for them, and guess what? However long this took, however many days, however many weeks, God did provide for them. They all came back alive and fed. And so now they, they, these apostles are going out with Jesus to a desolate area, and presumably they think Jesus is going to provide for them as well. I mean, five loaves and two fish is not enough to feed the 13 or 20 or 25 people that are right around Jesus. So they, in their experience, Jesus is going to take care of them. So now, why? here's the question for us. They know Jesus can provide for them. So now when the crowds show up, 5,000 plus people, why do they think Jesus can't provide for all of them? Jesus is the Son of God He's the creator of heaven and earth. They've seen him do remark. They've seen him raise somebody from the dead. And they think 5,000 plus is, is too much for Christ. Look, look, it's the, it's the same for us, isn't it? We've seen God answer prayers. We've come to him with our sin and we know he's forgiven us. He's healed us of injuries. He's gotten us through that class. He's enabled us to forgive that person who, who hurt us so that we can continue in life and love one another. But then when, when something big comes up, something we can't handle, we think Jesus can't take care of that. And we forget that God provides all of our needs through Christ Jesus until he takes us home, and that through Jesus we can do all things that he calls us to do. He will provide for you as you come to him in faith. And so that's, that's why Jesus is reminding his disciples of this. And he says, you, you give them something to eat. I commissioned you to, to heal and to preach, to cast out demons. I've used you. You just saw me use you. Now I want to use you again. Now, now here's not what Jesus is not saying. He's not expecting his apostles to create matter. He's not expecting them, them to multiply the, the bread and the fish miraculously. We don't see anyone in the scriptures besides God create matter. If you ever hear of a religious leader that says he can... It's, a, it's false. It's a cult. 
No, that's not what Jesus means. What Jesus means is for them to do exactly what they end up doing. To bring what little they have and let Jesus multiply it. Let Jesus do the work through them. Do you see this? So, Jesus is feeding the multitudes, but in a way, he's doing it through the apostles. They're the ones that found this little bit of food, and they bring it to Christ. And then Jesus, as you know the story, verses 14 through 16, he tells the people to sit down in groups of 50. Some commentators think that's a reference to Exodus, but it might just be practical as far as distributing the food. And then he takes the loaves, he takes the fish, Jesus looks up to heaven, showing everyone that he's praying, this posture of reverence. Yes, his Father is everywhere, the Spirit is everywhere, but he is showing them that he's praying to the God of heaven and earth. And then the food is distributed, and somehow there is enough food for everyone. And the apostles distribute it, and then they pick up 12 baskets and bring it back. And so they do exactly what Jesus had commanded them. They fed the people, but only because Jesus was the one who did the work. You see that? Jesus could have just lined the 12 apostles up behind him and said, I'm going to do this. And Jesus could have then done it, but he does it through his church. If if we can figure this out, if there's a secret to the Christian life, then this is it, of learning how to be active and serving those around us while at the same time resting in Christ, trusting him to work through us. And so we are busy taking care of folks but we're not frantic. We are active in loving people, but we're not puffed up with our own sense of self-importance because we know it's only through Christ in us. And as I I think of my own life, sometimes I'm I'm too frantic. I just, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. I got to get this done. And sometimes I'm just too lazy, to be honest. But, But this is what I know. When I begin with in resting with Jesus in resting in what he has done and then saying, use me. Then he gives me things to do. When I come to Christ in prayer with with both my task list in hand, I use a yellow pad of paper, I'm old school, and also my limitations, the health limits he's given me, my energy limits, sometimes my just patience with people, and I bring both of them to him. Then he gives me things to do, but with a sense of purposefulness, a sense of restfulness, a sense of knowing that he's using me to do it. And very often what I find on this task list is I'm not really good at it, and so he gives me someone else that might be able to serve. And I I not force it on them, but I say, are you able to help this person? And they will able to. It's, It's the church doing it together. One of the best illustrations I've seen of this resting in Christ but yet still wanting to serve comes from a a movie called Hacksaw Ridge about World War II. And um, I can't really recommend it because it's so uh, bloody and gory. It's a Mel Gibson movie and all of his movies are like that. And I really just think we should be careful about that. But this movie was about a brutal battle and was about war. And it tells the true story of a man named Desmond Doss who grew up in Lynchburg. Uh, And when Pearl Pearl Harbor happened, he volunteered to serve in the Army. Now, he had a job where he could have been uh, working in a shipyard where he could have gotten a deferral, but he volunteered. But the problem was, because he grew up as a faithful Seventh-day Adventist, He was also a pacifist. And so the movie works out how the army figured out how to make him a medic. So he's still serving, but he doesn't have to hurt anybody. And then they send him to the battle in Okinawa with the 77th Infantry Division. And in his particular um, 
line and, and on the front, the, the army made some decision to climb up, climb up a cliff. It, it was stupid. It was suicidal to climb up this cliff and then send an attack into the plateau. And the attack is at first successful, but then the Japanese regroup and counterattack and drive them entirely off the ridge, leaving scores of wounded American troops. And so the story shows Desmond, as a medic, going into this dangerous no man's land and bringing back casualties. And between each casualty that he treats and then brings back to get lowered down the cliff, between each one he prays, Lord, help me to get just one more. Just one more. That's all he asks. And as he goes and gets one more wounded casualty and lowers him down, he prays once more, Lord, help me to get just one more. And he is credited with saving the lives of 50 to 100 Americans. But here's the point. He only tried to help one at a time, and between each casualty, he asked God for help, and God gave it to him. And so here, I think Jesus is trying to teach his disciples that principle. Yes, care for all of these people, but I know you're exhausted, but trust that I can do it through you. Finally, there is one last lesson Jesus wants to teach them and us very Brief and very simple, and that's what we see in verse 17, that Jesus provides abundantly. Did you notice this? That after everyone is fed, they pick up 12 baskets of the eaten pieces, and nobody wants them. They're all satisfied. They're all sated. That's it. Our cups overflow. And so Jesus wants to see that he teaches his disciples to see that he teaches his people, he heals his people, and then he feeds them abundantly. And this is what we are trying to do as a church imperfectly. We're, we're trying to teach you the goodness of Christ, the, the love of God for this world. We're trying to provide healing spiritually and physically as we pray and, and provide for the needs that this is a place of healing. And then we also want you to be fed fed with the goodness of God, and lit sometimes literally, and one day we'll get back to potlucks and, and show that we, we it's an important symbol of, of fellowship. And so this is a picture of God's abundant provision for us through Christ that our cups overflow, and each of the disciples get one basket each. I'm sure there's symbolism with the new Israel, the, the 12 baskets, but I think it's really that God, Jesus is showing them I'm teaching you that I provide abundantly. Here is your basket. And throughout their ministries, throughout their lives, they can remember this time when God provided abundantly and they were able to keep going. So that sometimes when they felt abandoned, they knew that Jesus would be there for them. And then when they run into others that feel abandoned, they would say, let me help you, not with my strength, but with the strength that Jesus provides. So what do you need to hear this morning? Begin by resting in Christ and what he has done for you. You're going to live forever. Begin your week with that great news. And then remember that he always welcomes you. He always has time for you, that he loves you. And then let that be an example for you to welcome others. Remember also that Jesus works through you. He's doing miraculous things. But we are the ones who give people things to eat through Christ. And then finally, that he will provide for all our needs in abundance. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a great story this is. And we pray that we would see the heart of Christ. And we confess that sometimes we feel abandoned by your church. 
And we confess sometimes that we are worn out from trying to help others. And so we would ask you to be our strength, Lord. As we face the tasks of this life, Lord, help us to do just one more. And we ask this through Jesus' name. Amen. And so, my friends, we're going to stand and sing of God's provision from Psalm 23. This is one of my favorite versions to sing. Again, you may not know.